It's great to see you. Thanks, Angela. Thank you for doing this. And uh, what you should know is when I got the call to host Masters of Scale, you were absolutely the first person that popped into my mind. There and you go. no, but I I witnessed firsthand actually the first month that you and I started in May of 14 at Apple, but I mm -hmm. witnessed firsthand your incredible passion, um, the the your how you used your instincts to guide you in everything you did. But I think even more importantly in this day and age, the courage with which you stood up to everything you believed in. And I actually think it's those attributes that have made you so successful and that every creative needs to know and understand so deeply in this future AI-driven world. So it is why I'm just, I'm so grateful that you're well, doing thank this. thank you. Yeah, well, you know, we had a we had a nice time there. You know, we worked, we both were there for about four or five years, and, you know, it's, it was an experience. It was an incredible experience. But before we go there or okay. go too far ahead, okay. um, I want to go way back for okay. a minute because um, you talked a lot about the influence of your father in your life. Yeah. And um, are there a handful of lessons that he taught you about standing up for what you believe? And <laughs> and and do you remember the time when he talked about you have you have magic ears? Well, my fa my father was a, a real character and a fabulous human being. And uh, you know, he was a longshoreman. He worked down the docks. He was a laborer for most of his life, and then he kind of moved up a little bit. But fundamentally, most of his life, he was a laborer down the piers and. He would uh, have these incredible things to say to me. Just uh, one of them was, you know, don't worry about it. Every room you go into is better just because you're there. <laughs> I love that. I had no idea what he was talking about, but I managed to tell all my kids <laughs> that because it really worked. <laughs> it was very, very effective. I bought it completely. Uh, but what do you think? What do you think he meant by it? Now that you reflect, what he meant? When it, well, it's, it's when I started working with John Lennon and those guys. You know, um, he told me that earlier as well. But when I started working in the studio, where I was really in above, I was in, I was, it was in above my head. He meant that. What he meant was, you're a good person, and you're loyal. All the sort of Italian esque attributes that he taught me growing up, they'll come in handy for you. You know. Committed to what you, who you are, believe, be proud of who you are, and be loyal and be a good friend. And you know what? Those were great things to take with you <laughs> into any room. <laughs> so I came from Red Hook, Brooklyn. There wasn't, there was one culture, Italian culture, right? <laughs> but not the Renaissance, not not just Italian <laughs> meatball hero, you know. Italian families and doing your thing. My mother's like a housewife. She had a job as a secretary too. My sister's living there and my father's a longshoreman. And we didn't go to Manhattan a lot. That was just, you know, it was Oz. You know, so we went there a bunch. I had a little job in Manhattan, went to the studio once. So now I'm going to the studio and I walk into this studio and the record plant was like really dark, really moody. And, you know, lights were really low. And and the guy at the console turns around and says, hello, James. <laughs> and it's John Lennon. And, you know, this is only three years after the Beatles broke up. So anyone who was around them, they were so big. It was so, to anybody who thought about music, they were, you know, it was, you know, 3 AD. You know what I mean? It was, it was three years after Christ. You know what I mean? It was like, oh, shit. <laughs> right? So now, first thing you do is get abject terror. Right? <laughs> but something about my father gave me the confidence, and I was afraid enough of what was behind me to mo keep moving forward and just feel comfortable somehow because he would have smelled because my boss was this incredibly powerful sort of personality. He's the guy that brought me in. My, he taught me engineering and um, he was a magnificent human being, incredible person, uh, eccentric and out there. So he brought me in and then 
it worked out so well that they took me around the country because we made we made records with John Lennon in in in, in California as well. And I don't know. I just um it was just a powerful thing. It was it was a it was all encompassing and it was the beginning of my education. That was that was really day one of my life. I absolutely <laughs> love that. Well, so so moving on a little bit, now you're this incredible producer. You're working with Lennon and all these Springsteen and all these amazing people. And I love the story how you convinced Springsteen to give the song to Patti Smith. And 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 I I would venture to guess that took, I mean, that had to I'd love to know your instincts. I mean, your your courage. How how did you do that? How did you get her to do it? But then, were there other instances, other that you did that? Well, with? when you when you're really young, I was um, see when I worked with Springsteen. When I did Born to Run, I was 22, and when I worked with Patty, I was 23, 24. Unbelievable. So it. Because Bruce and I have talked about this a hundred times, <laughs> literally, and it, it's become a, a folklore in our little community. <laughs> and what happened was uh, he was working on an album. He was working on Darkest on the Edge of Town, and he heard he had this album. He had this album in his head, and he wasn't sure if that type of love song fit on the record. And he didn't really finish it. So I heard it, and I didn't know that I had any kind of talent or anything like that. Because when you're that young, you're just, you're going. You're just like, don't let me get thrown out of this room, right? <laughs> so like, I'm, I'm going and I hear this song and I said, wow, if a girl sang this, it would be powerful. You know, cause the night, because the night belongs to lovers, right? It's one thing if a guy says it. <laughs> it's another thing if a girl says it, right? So... I heard that, and I I had giant conviction on it, and he we just went we went um, we went out to Coney Island together, and he um, I said Bruce, are you going to use this? I'm working with Patty. I said I don't have a first single. I said are you working? Are you going to use this song? He said no. I said can I give it a shot with Patty? And he said he's very simple. He says yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I took it back. Now I got to convince Patty. So I went back and Patty, she goes, I write my own songs. I don't, I don't, I said, Patty, this is a moment in time. You're both from New Jersey. If we capture this, it would be magnificent. And she tells a story of, I, I gave it to her on a cassette, actually, cassettes in the other room, believe it or not. And she had it on her mantle and her, she had just met her then, her soon to be husband, Fred Sonic Smith. And and she was waiting for him to call, and it was late. And so she saw the tape and said, oh, screw it, I'll just write that song, for write the lyrics, because Bruce hadn't written the lyrics. He only wrote the chorus. And she wrote, um, love is a ring, the telephone, desire is hunger, the fire I breathe, love is a banquet on which we feed. And when she played that for me, I said, that's exactly beyond what I could have imagined you wrote, because those lyrics are so powerful. And uh, it was my first hit record as a producer. So like, you know, I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> Maybe I do have magic No, ears. you could just, you can make, <laughs> I mean, who knows, right? I mean, let's say it's all luck, then I'm lucky, right? So that's good. But anyway, that's how that came about. But it took the conviction. First of all, they get the guts to ask Bruce for the song. Because when he's working in those days, he was very, very, very intense. And there wasn't room for any bullshit. He was just like focused on what he was doing. And we all had to be focused. If you watch him on stage, you'll see that band has their eyes on him. It's like James Brown. They don't take their eyes off of him for three hours. And in the studio, it was the same deal. We watched for his every move, everything that he was doing. We we were so plugged in to those two albums or what I did I worked on it with. So to break that and to go say, Can I have this song? took a lot. And then when Patty first said no, it was terrifying because now I gotta go back and tell Bruce, no. I didn't think of asking Patty first. I, I just assumed, <laughs> you know. But anyway. Eventually she said yes, and it came out, and it did great. So um, it gave me a little bit of help on saying, okay, if I believe something, I can make it happen. 
and it's a good chance it'll be right. So that was a big, 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 big moment in my life. Amazing. Uh, yeah, it really was. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, and I think with that, it gives you the confidence. And I mean, it's, you know, your record stands for itself. From well, a, I from never a... thought, I never thought I'd have a hit record. as It was the first album I ever produced, you know? So I was like, because I was an engineer for Bruce Springsteen and John Lennon. So I was like, can I do this? And then when the record came out and it was a hit record, then I was like, hmm, well, that's, that's pretty good. I got to work with those people because I was fortunate from the ages of 20 to 25 those three or four years, I did th three albums with John Lennon, two with Bruce Springsteen, and one with Patti Smith. So those are really your college years, right? So, And you could take in a lot of information in your college years. So I had those three professors. I went in there, and I learned everything there was to know about the essence of the music and the music industry, the essence of it. And those three people, I learned from somebody who had an enormous experience uh, being John Lennon to Bruce Springsteen, who was just about to break. And then they were, all three of them were poets. So they were very, very particular on temperament and how to work and the quality of the work, the drilling down on the work. Uh, uh, you know, Bruce Springsteen was the, the most... He said something once that was so fabulous, and I, I wish today the music business would have would have more of it. He said, you know, I didn't want to be famous. I didn't want to be rich. Man, I didn't even want to be happy. I wanted to be great. And what's happened in the world today, I believe, in music, is not everyone, but uh, too much. Fame has replaced great. And because fame is a gigantic currency, you can have a hit record or some success and then live off the fame of Instagram and et cetera for another 20 years and make a ton of money and have a lot of success and be just in the, in, in, there was a time before Instagram, before all this stuff, where you had to make a great second album or you were going in the toilet. Now there's a whole other medium of Instagram and TikTok and et cetera. So you can maybe get famous and rich and, and by the way, and great, great first, right? Now it's not, there's a lot of time, a lot of creativity going into becoming famous. And I'm telling you, that affects the work and the quality of the work. I don't care what anybody says to me. I'm old, I'm right. <laughs> but... <laughs> Well, I agree. And I think it's interesting, too. I love how you call them poets. So then you moved to Interscope. And, and no, I, that was, I moved to Interscope 13 years later. Right. But I'm saying you had all of this time with these, this amazing talent. Then you go to Interscope. And I would assume you went in, based on everything you had learned, wanting to do things differently, wanting to... And, and did you carry through that, that the, the essence well, of those well, artists? Well, you know, it's the, funny... Um, I was a record producer, and I was a recording engineer. That's not who runs record companies, you know? So I went in there with the mindset of an assistant engineer, which is completely of service. You have to be in that job. You are of service. You are of service to the person behind that microphone. And without that person behind that microphone, you have nothing. So you learn that lesson over and over and over and over and over and again. And when the, when the mood gets a little less exciting, it's because the lyrics aren't as good, because the beat isn't as good, because the song isn't as good. <laughs> and you can't control that. So when something is that out of your control, when your pure passion and your success and everything is controlled by the quality of that song and how that person is performing it, you get an enormous amount of respect <laughs> for that after tw doing it for, I did it for 18 years. So I went into the record company saying, okay, these people, we need them. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I approached it like that. And then I approached record producers like that. So I built Interscope with my, with my co-partners and all that. We built it around record producers 
And artists with their own labels, like Dre with Death Row, Trent Reznor with uh, Nothing Records, uh, Timberland, and you know uh, Will I Am, and all these guys had their own labels. Pharrell, and we just built a company that they were driving, you know. And I was used to them driving. I put my energy and my will. So at times I was co-driving. Or even at times, because you got to, sometimes you battle in a studio because as long as an artist in music believes that you care as much about their work as they do, you're going to do okay. But you got to convince them of that. And they're not easy to convince. But there alone was the doing it differently versus all of the other I studios. I didn't know. You know what I mean? I, I, I had no idea. I, I had no idea how to run a record company. There were some great people running record companies. My God, David Geffen, uh, Ahmed Erdogan, et cetera. You know, incredible people. But I just came out from a different place because I was a record producer. And very few record producers went and did that. Uh, I didn't know that at the time. But, uh, I mean, Chris Blackwell did. He was a record producer for a short time. And he found Bob Marley and you too, and he was an extraordinary human being and still is. But there weren't a lot of them. Mm -hmm. And what did you mean? I read a couple of times when you said, Dr. Dre will define Interscope. There was a company called Atlantic Records, and they had, in the 70s, they had Aretha Franklin, Ray Charles, the Rolling Stones, and Led Zeppelin. So we wanted black culture and pop rock, rock culture and we wanted the extremes of that. We wanted it banging at the same time. So I didn't know a lot about hip hop. So all of a sudden, Suge Knight and Dr. Dre come in my office with this fellow, John McClain, who started Interscope with us. And I heard the music and I said, oh. <laughs> I just literally, I said to, I said to Dre, because I didn't like the sound of hip hop records. I didn't, sonically, I didn't understand it, how the mixing was going down. But Dre took it to another level and did something completely different. And he understood how to control the bass and make it so powerful. He still probably, everyone feels the best mixer of, uh, of music out there. And so I heard it and I said, who engineered this? And he said, I did. And I said, who produced it? He said, I did. <laughs> I said, this guy's going to define Interscope. Because what he brought was, he brought the essence and the edge of the Rolling Stones you know, he brought that thing where in the early days, the Stones would scare you, but bring you in with their music, you know, because if you were a kid, right? And Dre and Snoop and Pox music, all those guys, that music did that. But Dre knew how to make it into a record that was palatable for everybody. That's why The Chronic, is, which was Dre's album, was one of the biggest instruments in spreading hip hop around the world. And uh, it was because of that album. And I think uh, everybody would tell you that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and, you know, a lot happened at Interscope. Like you said, you were going where no man had ever gone before. <laughs> and and so share share some of the unexpected things and how you had the courage to deal with those. Well, you know, I, I got a little bit of a taste of it when I was working with John Lennon. John Lennon was an incredible, 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 glorious human being and powerful and just extraordinary. And I didn't know, right before I started working with him, he had done all the stuff about Vietnam and all that stuff. So he got on Nixon's radar. And Nixon spent a lot of time trying to get him out of the country for an old uh, marijuana bust in London. And I watched him go to court every day. They were challenging his green card. So I was saying like, President, the President of the United States? I was like, how do you, how does the President of the United States even know you're here? You know, but it was so above my head. I didn't understand it, right? But I saw it and I felt it. I said, wow, the government could come in and censor this person. I was like, oh, wow, that's... And I lived it, but I didn't pull from it until the death row days when C. Dolores Tucker and William Bennett and Bill Clinton tried to get Time Warner to get rid of us, you know, and they were going full blast at us on the, on the Congress floor, et cetera. And I said, I said to myself, wow, this is the same thing. 
So I said, you know, a lot of the people around me, our lawyers and stuff were saying, you got to get rid of this stuff. I said, no, I got to get rid of Time Warner. <laughs> okay? And uh, they said, but no one's going to want to work with the label. Everybody's afraid of these guys. I said, no, 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 no. People will take deli tickets to work with Interscope. Trust me. <laughs> One of them said, you're going to be selling pencils. I said, I don't care. You see, because problems are funny, especially scary ones. First of all, most, most things like that really are poltergeists. You know, my favorite scene, one of my favorite scenes in his movie is in Steven Spielberg movie, when, when the, the little sort of, I don't know what she's, ghost wrangler woman, <laughs> says to the family, walk through the light, it's just a poltergeist. And I feel that most things are like, I feel that fear is that, right? So at a very early age, I had a choice. And because I was as afraid as anyone, I mean, I was 20 years old and I, I was from Brooklyn. I, I'd only been to New York like five times or something like that. And I walked in the studio with John Lennon. I had a choice. Either fear was going to push me back or from behind push me forward. So I decided it was going to push me forward. And then eventually I learned to like the feeling of fear. And that was an incredible feeling. Then I used to use it to really energize. So when somebody says to me, your company's going to shut down, you're going to be out of business, no one wants to work with these guys. I, I didn't know the other labels, all these people. They said, no one's going to want to work with Interscope. I said, bullshit. You know? <laughs> and um, we took it right to the edge. And we got out of Time Warner, and we went over to, um, to Universal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Incredible. When you're starting a company, everything you read, this interview, right? Everything you read or hear or see or you watch, you know, Steve Jobs or Bill Gates or any of these guys, the problem is going to come at you in a different way. You're not going to reckon, you're not going to say, well, I saw Bill Gates had that problem and he did this. The problem's going to come dressed completely different with a different costume on, you know. And look completely different. You got to apply that stuff you learned to a brand new problem. And just know that I believe you're better off failing because then you'll learn, A, what you're good at, what you're not good at. And you'll learn that a lot of fear is just that, a ghost. You know, you're hypothetical of what could happen to your life. You know, by the way, I didn't have any, I had nothing. I, I, I was, you know, it would have been devastating for me, you know, because I, I was growing up when I was successful as a kid. I just spent every penny I had. <laughs> I was like, okay, you know, so I, I didn't care. But um, it's just, you got to, you got to move forward. You got to let that fear, it can't be, it can't be a headwind. It's got to be a tailwind. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you let it take you, then you won't, it's funny because then, you know, looking ahead, I mean, then along comes this thing called Napster. And that had to, I mean, how you dealt with that. And no, how it pissed you... me off. It didn't, it didn't scare me. It pissed me <laughs> off that these guys, I, it pissed me off that these sort of what I called at the time nerdy guys just didn't give a shit. And they were just going to do their thing and act like, oh, you know, this is the future. Well, it's the future if, if it's done right. You know what I mean? It's not the future if it's, um, you know, uh, devastating another industry. So I went, I went to Intel because I didn't know what to do. I thought, I better go learn about these guys, you know, these guys that are rip it, burn it and all this other stuff, right? So I went, <laughs> I, met, I met with Intel. I met with one of the founders and he said to me, you know, Jimmy, it's a fabulous story, but not every industry was made to last forever. I said, wow, I never heard that before, right? <laughs> so, and, but he's right, but I didn't think of it like that. So what I did was I said, okay, we're going to, we're going to overcome this. And I realized that at that moment, music had to be more than just selling songs and doing stuff like that. And I'm realizing, okay, I got to morph my company. I have to build something and laterally. I'm watching all these big companies 
use music and make billions of dollars. And we're sitting here in the record business getting banged like this and everyone else is using the IP from MTV to whoever else and they're making a fortune. So I said, I got to work with our artist and, 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 and come up with other ways to build something incredible, other companies. And that's where Beats came from. And you know something, I'll tell you something else that's interesting, I think people find interesting, is that when I first came up with the idea, I offered it to Universal. I said, give me money for Interscope and I will start businesses with your artist. And they said, no. So I threatened to leave. I said, because I'll stay if I can do it myself. And I'll do it alongside of you and I'll give you a piece of it, but I want to do this. I'm not going to be the guy to sell the last CD. <laughs> so I was ready to quit because I had sold Interscope to them and they wanted me to stay, but I wouldn't stay unless I did this. And that's how I ended up owning it. But the fascinating thing to me with Beats is that it was the first time that you took, a, not you, but you took a very 360 approach to it. It wasn't just the product it was the artist it was the marketing it was the well you know I, a music american music a lot of music owns an extraordinary amount to african-american culture i owe so much to african-american culture so what i did was in my day you weren't allowed to do that if you were bruce springsteen bob dylan stevie nicks anybody you weren't allowed to sell product because then you were selling out or whatever it was called, right? <laughs> yeah. So my training is, uh-uh. But then all of a sudden, I'm watching Puff Daddy and 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 the guys at Def Jam and all these guys. I'm saying, they're cooler than us. They're cooler than me, at least. You know what I mean? They're cooler than me. Huh? <laughs> I'm going to do that. So it was very inspirational. It gave me real license to say, okay, I'm going to look at this differently. You've always got to be willing to start again, to begin again, and say everything I know when I woke up this morning could already be wrong. And if you live your life like that, you never know what's going to happen, right? What goes on in the world, and I deal with a lot of companies now, and I, ever since I sold Beats, I've dealt with a lot of different companies. I meet a lot of different people. Everybody's afraid to lose their job. You know, and some people should be afraid to lose their job, but some people shouldn't be if they really want to achieve their potential. Every story I told you, I could have lost my job on any of those jobs at, at any moment, but I've never been afraid to lose my job. I found one of the greatest pivots that you did was you created Beats, but then, I don't know, three, four years later, you decided to produce our, all the hardware yourself? when the company would never done that before? I mean, that yeah. was another big bet. It was, but we had to. You know, I, I brought on Luke Wood, who helped us, uh, became the president of the company, and we decided that we wanted to take it and do it ourselves, right? We had, uh, we were using a company that was going to manufacture and distribute and sell for us, and uh, but we had the designer always, uh, Robert Bruner, and we just said, let's do it ourselves. But the craziest thing about Beats was, when we started Beats Music was because like I saw personally, Interscope Records, Beats and Beats Music as one thing under one hood, under one roof. So I saw them making the records, playing them back on an instrument, which was the headphones, and I saw the distribution of music. I wanted them all in the same company, right? And not everybody saw it that way. But the dream was to have it all in one place. Now, it's not in one place. And I believe the streaming services are suffering. I think the record companies are hurting because they don't have an audience. They don't have a direct audience. Mm -hmm. The streaming services have their audience. Right, right. So right. now you have two companies with two different agendas and you don't have an audience. And the streaming services don't own the content. So 
They're not making any money. There's no margins in it. So it's a goddamn mess, in my opinion, right? So I always felt it should be together. And, but I, I you know, I, I ran out of personal runway, to be honest. Yeah, but the other thing, I, I think Beats is just such a great story. Because it started out one way, then you started producing the hardware, then you launched into the streaming, but then you start putting on all the athletes. I mean, you always had a way of blending culture. You, it's well, almost like you didn't look at anything in a linear way. I believe in abstract thinking, meaning that I, th I always look for people that see things that go together that not everybody see goes together. I call it abstract. I think somebody else calls it abstract thinking. I have no idea, but that's what I call it. And that's just like, oh, these things belong together. Like, for example, when we started Beats, we started with music, musicians, videos, music videos. And then one day at Interscope, we were making more than a game with LeBron James. And I knew that him and Maverick loved hip hop. They loved hip hop. They loved Dr. Dre. So Maverick says to me in my office one day, Maverick Carter, and he says, give me, some, give me those two headphones for me and LeBron. I said, absolutely. They call me back. He says, LeBron wants 15. He's going to Beijing, I think it was, for the Olympics. He wants them for the whole team. I said, great. I said, do me a favor. Ask them to wear them around their neck and stuff when they get off the <laughs> plane, right? Because I think marketing, right? <laughs> so then... You learn and you got to be open because they, okay, ah, LeBron's using these things to get inspired to exercise. Okay, we're going to switch our marketing to athletes. And our thing is going to be, you make it up as you go. We inspire, <laughs> you to get more out of it. If you look, there's commercials with Dre and, and LeBron lifting weights and all that stuff. I mean, we would do anything. So- but that's how that happened. Yeah. It happened because LeBron, I just said, oh, my God, look at that. But you're open to it, right? I think yeah, so many times people just stay in their lane, but you were open, every, you connected you the had, dots. Everybody and, has a hit in life, and what the first thing they do is they breathe their own exhaust. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I don't know anybody that didn't have a hit record. I don't know anyone in my life that hasn't had a hit record or a hit television show or something. So it, it, yeah, it's great and it's hard to do, but it can't be that impossible or that special. So what you've got to worry about is making your next one, not a victory lap on your old one. So every day I'm looking for, I'm desperate looking for the next thing. I don't care what it is. I'm saying, what is the next thing? Because that was yesterday. And I've always looked at life like that. Maybe when I was a kid, Springsteen came to my birthday and made a little speech. And he said about me, he goes, you know, Jimmy, you're successful, but you managed to keep enough of that. You managed to keep enough of that low self-esteem that got us all here. You know, <laughs> and I, I think he's right. You know, I, 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 I just always look at it like that could have been the last thing that I ever did. And, you know, that's kind of it. I never felt anybody owed me anything. And I just, and I'm always looking for, the thing that I got in those early years of my life from 20 to 26, I'm looking for that talent that can move the world, that can shake the world, you know? And if ever I meet people like that, I just go, I'm of service. I felt that way when I met Steve Jobs. I, that was my next question. I was going to say, you have to share well, it's true. that story. The, Doug Morris, the head of Universal, said, go up to Cupertino, see Eddie Q and Steve Jobs, they're going to show you a thing called iTunes. They want our license. Tell me what you think. So now we're in the middle of Kazaa, Napster, and the record industry is being ransacked. And it's a, sh it's a mess. And we have lawyers up the wazoo suing everybody <laughs> and doing everything you could possibly do wrong, right? So I go up there and we're, we land at Apple, right? And Apple was a big deal, much bigger than anything that we were doing. So I go in there and I go to the I go to their original um, conference room, and I meet with Eddie and Steve, and um, I start hearing their vision for music, and I realize. And then Steve starts talking, and he knows how to talk to me. I said, "This guy Steve understands the crossing of liberal arts and technology." 
I said, no, I met with all these guys. No one else gets it. This guy understood the why of John Lennon. I spoke to him about it. He got it at its core. He just didn't like the music. He understood the person who made the music. So we need to put all in on this guy, you know? And when I met the guy at Intel, he said to me, not every music, not, not every business, was, not every industry was meant to last forever. Steve had a different take on it. And so did Eddie. So like I'm listening, I'm going, okay, wow. So I left and I just called up Doug Morris. I said, Doug, the party's at Steve's house. <laughs> you know, I said, and I just said, we got to aim our boat in his direction. And we did. Interscope, we did all the early commercials for iTunes. We helped them tune iTunes. We just, out, Interscope went all in on iTunes. And um, everybody, people did the license, other companies were involved. But I was going to make sure we were, as far as Eddie and Steve was concerned, we were their pets. Because we were going to be of service to Apple. And, you know, it worked out. I didn't stop until 2014, till they bought my company. I was going <laughs> to end up there somehow. I, I wasn't quite sure how. I never thought it was going to be like that, trust me. And, you know, to be honest, where do you think Beats came from? We, he had a shiny iPod. We had a shiny headphone. He made white, ear, he made white earbuds. I made black. You know, I, <laughs> I'm not original. I said, okay, this guy's got it. I'm just going to, what is he missing? Ah, oh, he's missing good headphones. <laughs> okay, I'm going to make them, you know. And it sounds simple, but it was simple. It was hard, but it was simple. And he helped me. And Eddie helped me and all those guys, they were great. But that's how that happened. So how was the first day at Cupertino? Um, it was it was different. It was, it was a different, different, different culture. Because, you know, Steve was gone. These guys are all great. But um, I'm used to, like, I break a lot of things on the way, you know? Because I don't really know what I'm doing. I have an instinct, but I don't know how to do a lot of things. So it was different for me. And they're fabulous. They're an incredible company. Boy, and I'm so glad because, you know, Apple getting into streaming really helped the record industry because it kind of it kind of validated the whole Spotify thing. And everybody said, okay, now Apple's in. If you remember, remember, there was only 3 million subscribers in America when Apple got in the game. So, and Daniel Ek's done it. They, you know, the record industry should hold a, they should make a statue of Daniel Ek. I thought he did an incredible job. Just getting <laughs> the licenses out of them was impossible. So um, I think he did a great job and still does. But but the guys at Apple, they were fabulous. I mean, it was just very different from anything I'd expected or ever seen. It was very, very, very different. Because the problems you have to me in tech, tech companies and in the arts and in design is none of the people really speak each other's language and understand the why of each other. And in order... To work together, you have to understand the value of the other person. So what I noticed at Beats and then I noticed it at Apple, what Steve knew, in essence, even about me, and I'm like this compared to people we were talking about, but anybody, he understood why that was necessary in the thing. I'm not saying the people at Apple are different, but engineering in itself sees things differently than people in the arts. But Apple, I found to be an, as I don't need me to tell you, it's an extraordinary place. And what they did with that Apple from when Steve passed, what they did with the company is incredible. The scale of it is just, talk about the show being about scale, talk about scale, <laughs> right? And uh, they run it really well and they have a lot of great stuff, a lot of great people there. But it was, Really different for me. It was uh, because I'm, I work very, very loose. And, you know, at that moment, I'm not embarrassed to admit, I was the tail wagging the dog. I'm used to being on the dog. <laughs> so, when you know, music was a, this big in Apple. And they respected it and were great. But nonetheless, I can't be the person scratching the car. You know what I mean? And 
so I felt that, but you know, but they were really supportive and gave me a lot of a lot of leeway, and we did a lot of great stuff. But I, I was a little, you know, I did, I did, I wasn't always that comfortable. I've had a blessing in life. Maybe again, to go back to what Springsteen said, is no love without low self esteem. That I don't, I don't think what I know is that solid. I'm like, I'm always like, oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know. When I met Steve and Eddie, I just changed on a dime. I was like, <laughs> oh, okay, we're going there. And I just, I did, I ended up at Apple. I pointed my boat there in 2004. <laughs> that was before the iPhone and the iPod just came out. I said, oh, my boat's going there. And I, by the way, I didn't stop till I was at Apple. I didn't stop. I went to see Tim Cook and Eddie, they'll tell you, for two years, every two months. I didn't care. You know how many times they said no to me? Whatever two years and one month is. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> they, said, they said no and then because it wasn't right for them and all this other stuff. But then we finally did it and I got to be there. And my experience there was tremendous. I mean, it, it's on a scale that I never imagined. And I, I had to learn, first of all, to think that, which I can now offer to young people, I have to learn, I had to learn how to work inside something where I, my thoughts, my idea wasn't the big idea. I was working on something that was smaller than the big idea. And that's when you ask me what I what happened to me at Apple. That's what I I remember. I remember walking with Tim Cook one day, and I said, "Tim, I said I'm working like a 20 year old broke guy." I said, "You know, I said I'm 50 something years old, whatever it was." I said, "Am I on the motorcycle or am I on the sidecar?" <laughs> He said, no, Jimmy, you're on the motorcycle. It just doesn't look like every day like you're on the motorcycle. I said, okay. I said, I feel like I'm on the sidecar. But he was incredible, gracious, and just spectacular while I was there. And But but it was, um, I don't really, I really can't even quite explain it. It was just, I just learned so much that what I got out of it was I really wanted to help change education. So at Apple... Was there a specific moment or or something you recalled that led you towards education, like an aha moment that Well yeah, when I what happened was when I, when I had beats first and I was trying to find employees that understood what we were trying to do between culture and technology, right? Because remember when I met Steve Jobs, the first thing he said to me was that we're crossed between technology and the arts. And no one else had ever said that to me, you know, and, and, and it just stuck with me. And I said, okay. And I, I, so when I had beats, I said, oh shit, this is what he's talking about. <laughs> I can't find people that understand both languages or understand each other. It's like you either get this or this. Mm -hmm. So then we went to Apple and I said, oh. And then I, then I met people at Google and I met people at Amazon and I met people at all these companies. And, I, and then I went to the record industry and they have, they're just that. Right? So I said, these people are all siloed. And they're siloed because they learned in a siloed way. They didn't get the experience. So I said, oh, school needs to be not siloed. And that, whether that's true <laughs> or not, but that's what hit me. You know, I, I, like it was like a lightning bolt. I have no idea. First of all, I don't listen to people that speak about education. So I have no idea if somebody <laughs> thought that before. Maybe they did. But... Um, I, I most certainly never thought of it. So me and Dre, because we're crazy, we went and we put up a lot of money <laughs> to start this school where multidisciplinary learning, you know, you kid for a kid who leans design, who leans engineering and leans in the arts and entrepreneurship work together on projects and, they, and the teachers all work together. And it's really work. We've been open for 12 years now at USC. Look, I'm not shy to say that I think Google, Apple, um, Amazon could all use people from our school that have this education. I think it's the, personally, I think it's the future of education. Silo learning should be dead as a duck because I, I go to these companies, I go, I see them. They have, most of them have engineering societies. It's very, very important, but it can't ultimately drive creative. 
It can't, and it shouldn't. And um, so the leaders of the future, if they're fluent in other disciplines and understand the why of the other disciplines, it's going to make for a better world because I knew early on that tech companies were going to buy all the distribution of these of these uh, content companies. It was just too obvious. I mean, you don't have to be even smart to see that coming, right? I, I think what I love just hearing your life story is you've always been a step ahead, always. And I don't even think you realize now how ahead the USC Academy is with as we're in this pivotal year and and AI starts to to drive the world. Well, I think what's fascinating, though, is society has evolved, technology's evolved, but curriculums haven't evolved. They haven't kept pace. I have a friend whose son is an incredibly musician. He went to an accounting university and he went to a law school. And what I tried to explain to his father is one of my great friends, I said, I got to tell you something. Now, the law school didn't exist then. I said, the siloed learning for a kid like this, you're going to shut off a side of him. And that goes for every kid. Kids are all brought up with a multidisciplinary talent right now. I think we'll look back someday and this will be as successful as you've been across so many areas, this will be your greatest legacy, what you're doing. Oh, and thank and, you. I, no, I and, mean, I, and I thank you for it. You're so open to all of the lessons. You don't see them as failures. You don't, they're lessons learned that you then race ahead and apply to something else, which I think is just, again, that's, a fascinating. That's, that's exactly it. And it's got nothing to do with anybody who's involved. I, I, I'm just saying, oh, wow. What I saw when I, when, I, when I went, when I had Beats and went to Apple, and then I met the people at Google and all these different things, I said, Oh, education. I don't know why I said education. I could have said Coney Island. <laughs> I could have said anything. I said, I could have said fashion. I said education. And then I went like a lunatic in that direction. <laughs> I mean, so that's what Dre and I wanted to do. And we believe it and we go to the schools and we're going we're gonna to scale this thing somehow. Absolutely. Somehow. Don't you find when you're always ahead of the curve, like you've been throughout your career, that that you hit headwinds? And, you know, you mentioned that you're running the same thing now in education that you ran into before in the music industry. Can you go a, a bit deeper on that? Well, if, we, if, if we're doing this, why do something like this, like a podcast like this? You do it to see if you can help some young people, right, that are out there, you know, got ideas and they feel like foreign, they feel like a fish out of water <laughs> or whatever, right? So when you say ahead of the curve, you don't think you're ahead of the curve when you're trying to do something. People tell you you are ahead of the curve later. You know what I mean? Maybe. Who knows, right? I always feel like, you know, the Beatles, right? Which was ground zero for my generation, right? They weren't the only guys with those haircuts. You know, when, when you're thinking of something, a lot of people are thinking it. It's who can execute on it. I don't think that I was the only person thinking of the things I'm thinking about. So it's, but I had the will and the, my father always said, another thing my father said, he just said, look at me, he goes, you know, you have, you have more balls than brains. So uh, <laughs> I think he was right. So anyway, uh, you know, but yeah, I'm reading resistance because everyone is so protective of what they know and so afraid of what they don't know. And I, I'm all, you're, you're, no matter what you're doing, you're always going to run into someone who's protecting at a higher level than you or as a gateway to what you want to get to, protecting what they know. Even though, as you have said throughout this podcast, you've used the word serve, serve the artist, serve... But really what they should be doing is serving the next generation. Well, you know, what they should be doing is realizing that everything they know could already be wrong. That's what they should be doing because that's the only way. I listen to the youngest people. I listen to people on the street because you never know where something is going to come from. And... Oh, again, fear is ground zero 
for success. It's ground zero. You got to deal with it. You got to deal with it because fear is going to chase you. So it might as well chase you forward <laughs> than chase you back. <laughs> you know, because when you grow up and you say, okay, I can't go back. That's worse than failing. I, I don't mind. Failing is better than not than going back. Right? So uh, that's just kind of how you well, got And to I it. would argue that's multiplied a hundredfold in education. Yeah, well, it is. It is because you're dealing with unions and you're dealing with, in, in, on every level of education, even at the higher education, you're dealing with, you know, presidents and deans and boards and, and you're dealing with, you know, locked in people that have been doing this for 30 years. And some people are incredible and very open. Some people are less open. I look at it this way. When you're doing something, especially to the young people that are listening to this thing, when you're doing something, get far enough to get a test case. Then no one can take it away from you. If you have to just go out and get the money yourself, do whatever you have to do. Prove it yourself. Well, we always like to end this session with what we call lightning round questions. Okay. Oh, so um, messy desk or clean desk? No desk. Ah. Artificial intelligence fills you with hope or dread? I'm in. I'm all in on artificial intelligence. All in. I think it's going to be great for the recording because uh, I think you could say, play me something, make me something that is Johnny Cash only with the Dre beat. And you may not hear something great, but you may hear give you an inspiration for something else. And it, I think it's going to be fabulous for creativity. I look at it as a real jumping off point. I don't know anything about it. If it's going to do the finished product, great. But I would love, if I was making records, I'd love to have it as a tool. The one thing you wish your phone could do. Okay, the one thing I wish my phone could do was have AI and make my texts better than they are. <laughs> Smarter. <laughs> And your smartest time-saving hack? I don't have a problem time-saving. I'm I I learned from David Geffen to try to be the shortest distance from here to there. I just I have no trouble. I don't care if I'm wrong, right? I just I can get to the point really quick and make a decision. I I have no trouble ordering from a menu. <laughs> I don't care if I get it wrong. I just make a decision. And what's your favorite place to think big? Right now, it's in my roller skating rink. I have a roller skating rink. I get on those skates. I play music really loud. It's always inside of music. I only think big inside of music. And it's usually Bob Dylan, Bruce Springsteen, you know, stuff like that. Or, or Dre's Chronic album I listen to all the time. Born to Run is big with me. <laughs> so my play, my biggest place to think big is in music. Love it. What's one object from your childhood that you just can't throw away? The problem is my sister was able to throw them away. <laughs> so I don't have anything from my childhood, <laughs> to be honest with you, other than my dad's watch. So my dad's watch. Mm. Is there a book that most influenced you? No. And the only reason why I haven't written one, because I don't want to have written more than I've read. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I bet you no one's given you that answer before, right? <laughs> I love it. The single greatest embarrassment of your career. Single biggest embarrassment. There were a lot. There were a lot, you know. Um, there were a lot of things that I just didn't deliver on how successful I wanted them to be or how great they wanted them to be. I really wanted to change the record business. And I I wanted to get with people and really change it. I think we impacted it. I don't think we changed it. I think it's left for someone else to change, other people to change. But I think it needs to be changed. Is there a single greatest achievement of your career? Well, my, I mean, you know, first of all, that's, that's a, that's a multi-layered answer. First of all, I'm married to a great woman. I have six great kids between us. And it is not easy. 
right? So I'm very, they're all good people. And that's not just me saying that. In my career is that I pivoted. DJs are great because their attention span, they get bored faster than their audience. When you're listening to a DJ and he changes a song, how does he know that's exactly when you wanted him to change the song? Because he or she gets bored before you. So I'm like that. I changed my career basically four times. And I'm very proud of that because if I was doing the same thing for 50 years, I just, I wouldn't have been comfortable right now. I'm comfortable right now for me, not for everybody, yeah. because I changed careers three or four times, whatever it was. Yeah. And I'm, I'm very pleased with that. Favorite song lyric? Wow. Uh, you're an idiot, babe. It's a wonder how you still know how to breathe. <laughs> you make me laugh that I can't read the next question. <laughs> That's a great lyric. It's a great lyric. Idiot win, Bob Dylan. What's the most creative measure of success you've ever set for a team? Well, okay. When we had beats, I went to the people at Interscope in one of my meetings and I had two headphones and I held them out and I said, the headphones are like medical equipment. They're sterile utility pieces of utility. They're, they're, they're commodities right now. I held up the two headphones and I said, this one's Axl Rose and this one's Tupac. I want people to feel that way about these headphones. I want to give them life and a personality. And I feel that we did that. And what's the best single piece of advice you've ever received? Easy one. John <laughs> Landau doing uh, Springsteen's albums when I was a kid. I had a real attitude from Brooklyn. I thought, you know, I thought I was being insulted, disrespected about something. I wanted to quit. And he walked in and he said to me, come here, you. I got to talk to you. He was old. He was always old. He's still is older than me. He was about three or four years older than me, but he was much smarter, right? More wiser. He lived in Manhattan, you know, stuff like that. And uh, he said to me, "I'm going to tell you something that's going to blow your mind. You never heard this in your neighborhood from your parents or anybody. This is not about you." I said, "What? <laughs> Everything's about me." <laughs> Just ask my mother, right? So he said that, and then he said. I want you to look at the big picture. No one had ever said to me, look at the big picture. And what the big picture meant was it's not about you, it's not about me. It's about the album, the big picture. What are we trying to do? Swallow your bullshit, don't breathe your own exhaust, keep your ego in the car and look at the big picture. That is the greatest advice anyone's ever given me still to today and I use it every day and that is the sole reason I believe that I was successful because I came up with moderate talent but I had the ability to always see the big picture in the room and that is the greatest gift I had ever gotten in my life. Amazing. Well speaking of big picture, last question, favorite movie ever? No, oh, it's a Godfather. One and two. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's an easy one. <laughs> Should be everybody's favorite movies. Every, every lesson you could possibly learn in the world is in that movie, is in those two movies. There is no other second choice, third choice, fourth choice. You're all wrong if you think there is. <laughs> And that's it. <laughs> <laughs> and he had the courage to say that. <laughs> Jimmy, this, is, this has been incredible, and I cannot thank you enough for doing this. Hey, it was great.